Before I begin today's video, I just want to take a moment to say thank you so much. I'm taping this the day after I uploaded the video announcing my Patreon, and I went to bed really early last night, a couple hours after I made that video. When I woke up this morning, I was overwhelmed. I thought I might have a couple, maybe three people who donated. I have way more than that. Thank you all so much. Not only to those who chose to contribute to the Patreon, but just everybody who watched and commented on that video in general. Um, wow, there was a way bigger response to that, positive response, than I expected. Um, I don't know what to say except thank you. That was so much more than, than, I, than I thought would happen. Uh, I am forever grateful for it, to those who contributed, and even to those who didn't, I am forever grateful for your support of the channel and continued viewership nonetheless. So anyway, just wanted to very quickly say thanks. So, let's look at some gosh darn vintage computer hardware. Today we are looking at a modem, a dial-up modem. This is a U.S. Robotics Courier V.Everything, and I will explain why it's called that later, serial modem, and it was made around 1996. So this is a modem that plugs into the serial port of your computer or terminal or whatever you had back in the day. For the last 10 years or so of the dial-up modem's reign, uh, most units in use were not serial modems like this, they were internal modems like this US Robotics Sportster that would plug into an ISA slot or a PCI slot. But in the early days of the dial-up modem, a serial modem was what most people had. And even in later times, if you were a business or if you were perhaps a sysop, a system operator of a bulletin board, you might have still used a serial modem because they still have many advantages over internal modems. A guy in the United States sent me this modem earlier this year, if I remember correctly, because it was a long time ago now. I, uh, I put a want ad out on Retro Machines, the vintage computing Facebook group that I'm a moderator of. And I said, hey, if anybody has a serial modem that they don't want, get in touch with me, because I, I was really wanting a serial modem. And uh, a guy got in touch with me, and for a fair price, he shipped me this one, which he bought new. He sent it to me with this letter, which reads, Thank you, Florence. I hope you enjoy the modem. I used it on my Amiga 3000T computer. I kind of miss the old handshaking sound. Robert. Well, thank you, Robert. Isn't that cool? This thing started its life on an Amiga. That's pretty darn cool. And that was one of the big advantages of serial modems over internal modems was that they are hardware agnostic. It didn't matter if it was a PC or a Mac or a Weiss terminal or a DEC PDP-8 or an S100 computer or, an, or whatever. It didn't matter. All that mattered was that it had an RS-232 serial port. This is what's called a Hayes compatible modem because in 1981, uh, Hayes Microcomputer Products introduced the Smart Modem. And the Hayes Smart Modem was the first intelligent modem that was platform agnostic. Worked on any machine as long as it had an RS-232 protocol serial port. Before the Hay Smart Modem, you could buy either a platform-specific uh, modem. Uh, for example, Hayes made the Micro Modem. They made a version for the Apple II, so it was Apple II specific, and it went inside the Apple II. And they made a version for S100 computers, like the MSI 8080. Or your other choice was an acoustic modem, which was platform agnostic. All you needed was an RS-232 serial port but it was a dumb modem. You couldn't control it from the computer. The only thing the modem was capable of was 
turning screaming on a telephone line into ones and zeros which it sent down the serial port. But the Hayes smart modem connected to a serial port and it was intelligent, you could control it right from the computer or terminal by typing commands to it through plain ASCII text that would be sent down the serial port. Very cool. And the Hayes smart modem began the Hayes standard that pretty much all modems afterwards, including this one, use. Another advantage of serial modems over internal modems is you get these all these indicator lights that tell you exactly what the modem is doing. You uh, don't really get that with these modems. The best you get is uh, whatever the modem tells you through the uh, terminal or terminal emulator if you're on a computer. And Hayes compatible modems, at least good Hayes compatible modems, are good about that. Uh, you know, when you dial into something and successfully connect to a remote modem, uh, the modem spits out some text describing uh, the type of connection that you achieved and the status of the connection and all that. Hayes compatible modems are pretty verbose, spitting data about what's going on to the computer. But... It's just really cool when you get all these red LEDs blinking away, letting you know exactly what's going on without the modem having to tell you on the screen what's going on. Now, I understand that uh, a lot of people who watch my videos may be young enough that they don't actually fully understand uh, what we did with these things back in the day. And I am just old enough to have lived near the end of the dial-up era, uh, a modem was how you, you know, as most people remember it, how you connected to the World Wide Web back in the day. Uh, dial-up internet is a telephone call. Your modem connects to your computer, either internally or through the serial port. And the modem has a telephone jack to connect to your telephone line. And you would have an account with an internet service provider who was usually the telephone company. It certainly was in my family's case back in the day. And they would give you a number to call. And you would issue a command to the modem to dial that number. Uh, or usually you wouldn't do that manually. That would be done automatically through, well, in, in the days of Windows 95, 98, Internet Explorer had the built-in capability to initiate a dial-up internet connection. But uh, it would tell the modem to dial that number that your telephone company told you. You called another modem at the telephone exchange, and that remote modem was connected to a computer that was then connected to the internet through other means. And that was how you got your internet connection. It was a telephone call. You paid for the telephone call and you paid a monthly fee for the privilege of being able to access uh, that remote modem. And of course, anybody who lived through dial-up internet, including myself, will tell you that it was slow as balls. You know, even 20 years ago, when the internet was so much smaller and simpler than it is today, dial-up internet was not fast, especially if you had to download... Uh, uh, big files back in the day and back in the day big meant a few megabytes <laughs> or even just a couple of megabytes could take quite a while and of course it tied up your telephone line you, you, you were on the phone with the dial-up internet provider so while you were connected to the internet you could not use your telephone now if your dial-up internet service provider was the same as your telephone line provider you might have been lucky enough for them to offer a feature where they could tell your modem when a call was coming in. They would send data to your modem alerting that somebody was trying to call you. And if you had a computer program installed, your modem could tell that program that somebody was calling you and then your computer program would tell you that somebody was calling you and you could hang up your internet connection and then your phone line would immediately start ringing so you could pick it up and talk to whoever was trying to call you. We had that. My mom had a program on our 
computer which ran Windows 98 and the, the program would make a ringing sound if you were connected to the internet and somebody tried to call you and you just clicked a button, the modem hung up and then the phone started ringing. It was pretty nifty. Dark times, dark times indeed. The fastest dial-up modems were 56 kilobits per second. Uh, that was the most data that could be theoretically squeezed in 3 kilohertz of bandwidth down a telephone line. This modem is not a 56k modem. It's a couple of years too old for that. This is a 33.6 kilobit per second modem. And that's probably what most people had, you know, before high-speed internet became prevalent, was probably most people, if I had to guess, had a 33.6k modem. And those that did have a 56k modem probably connected at 33.6k anyway, because the internet service provider didn't support 56k, or their, the quality of their telephone line just wasn't good enough for a 56k connection. Back in the day, our connection was 28.8k. But of course, modems existed long before the World Wide Web. Before that time, people used modems for many other things. They would connect online services like America Online or CompuServe. Or they would dial into bulletin board systems, which is something I want to cover more in depth in a video someday. A bulletin board system is basically a remote computer that runs some software and that software could provide information for your local community. Uh, you could dial in and, and see what sort of public events were, were coming up. You know, actual towns and cities would have their own bulletin board system that you could dial into. Or uh, computer enthusiasts would make their own personal bulletin board systems that people could dial into where they could uh, chat with other people. They would have forums, you know, the, the precursor to today's modern forums was literally the bulletin board system. Or using a modem could be as simple as calling your friend on the telephone saying, hey, I've got that file that you wanted, do you want me to send it to your computer? And your friend would say, sure, you guys would hang up, you'd call him again using your modem, his modem would answer, and then you would send the file. Just, you know, a simple peer-to-peer -peer file transfer you might use a modem for back in the day. And, of course, most modems after the late 80s or early 90s, including this one, do have facsimile capability. So, a modem might have done a, as simple of a job as sending and receiving faxes. Hooked up to your computer, your computer's running a fax program. And that's all it would do, would, would be serving uh, to send and receive faxes. I've demonstrated that in a video in the past. But it's 2021, what the hell can you do with a modem now? Well, as it turns out, lots of really cool stuff. If you have a telephone line, which is really easy and cheap to get now, which is awesome, uh, you can do a few different things with a modem. You can use it to send and receive faxes if you want to. But many, many, many people today are still running bulletin board systems, dozens of them. Now, the majority of them are Telnet. You access them via an internet connection. Uh, but many people are still running dial-up BBSs. They have a phone line and a computer and a modem attached to it. And you call their computer and log into their BBS. I have made two live streams, probably about four, four and a half, five hours of footage between them of dialing into literally every uh, dial-up BBS that I could find a number for using this modem. So if you're so inclined after watching this video, you might check out those live streams if you haven't already. But it's cool! People running these dial-up bulletin board systems still. And they're all vintage computing enthusiasts. So you can find some really cool stuff on them. But not only that, and I, I find this even more wild, uh, there are... Well, I only know of one person right now, but I know a guy who is running a dial-up internet service provider of his own. He 
He himself is a dial-up internet service provider and it's free. If you go to dialup.world, that's the URL, you can read about it. He has set up a computer with three different modems and he gives you the number on that website. You can call that number with your modem and dial into the internet and it's totally free. You just pay for the phone call itself, obviously. Although, actually, uh, I can connect to him for free, which is amazing because I use VoIP.ms and he also uses VoIP.ms. We use the same uh, phone line uh, provider. So calls between each other are actually free. So for completely free, I can actually dial into a dial-up, a real dial-up internet service provider that this guy is running, again, just for fun. That is so friggin' cool. So yeah, lots of neat things you can do with these things still. It's too bad. Lots of videos about modems uh, on YouTube, but the vast majority of them, they only go as far as saying, hey, look at this, and they might plug it in and turn it on, and then two lights light up, and then they're like, okay, bye, because they don't know what they can do with it. Or, more likely, they don't have a phone line and can't do anything with it anyway. Or, what some people will do with these particular modems, because they have the row of LEDs on the front, they'll modify them and turn them into some toy with blinky LEDs, which kind of makes me sad, but at the same time I get it. What the heck else are you going to do? Unless you're an eccentric person like me and the other modem enthusiasts in the world. And it's generally considered that of all the modems ever made, the U.S. Robotics Courier series is pretty much the best. The highest quality, most reliable, and most configurable. Uh, these are legendary modems. U.S. Robotics did make both uh, serial and internal versions of the Courier modems. Uh, they also made serial and internal versions of their uh, lower end home grade modems, the Sportster series, and you saw uh, an ISA, US Robotics Sportster modem earlier in this video. I do also have a Sportster serial modem, which I'll make a video about someday. So let's take a look at this thing. It's very much a uh, wide, long, flat slab. I believe this is the same dimensions as the Hay Smart Modem. And the reason for that was because the Hay Smart Modem was designed to be the perfect size to actually sit a Model 500 or Model 2500 telephone right on top of it and it would fit perfectly. And uh, I believe US Robotics did the same thing with the Courier. And sort of a party trick that the uh, Courier serial modems had was they had this voice data switch. Now you can actually program this switch to do anything, uh, which is pretty sweet, but by default what pressing that button does is, well if, if, if you were dialed into another computer, let's say you were dialed into your friend's computer transferring a file, and when the file was done transferring you wanted to talk to your friend without having to hang up and then recall him on the phone, you would pick up your phone, hit the voice data button, and he would do the same on his phone and then the modems would release control of the line and you would be talking on your telephones and if you wanted to go back to a modem connection to transfer another file or whatever he would hit his voice data button you would hit your voice data button and then hang up your phones and the modems would be back on the line and I don't think the modems had to re-handshake or anything. I think they just resumed uh, the already established call, which was nice. You go around the back. There's your RS-232 serial port. You have two RJ-11 jacks. One goes into your telephone line and one you would plug your telephone into. If you so wanted to uh, have a telephone connected into it. There's your power jack. This modem takes a 9 volt AC power supply. But if you get one of these and it didn't come with the power cord and you don't have a 9 volt AC power transformer, you can use a 9 volt DC power supply. It'll work just fine. These run on 9 volts DC. 
US Robotics just chose to put the uh, DC components, the rectification and voltage regulation and filtering inside the modem itself rather than inside the power brick so that's why these use a 9 volt AC power brick but you can plug in DC and it works just fine and your power switch and if you look at the bottom good guy US Robotics did a very cool thing by putting ex explanations for all the LEDs and a summary of the most useful commands to issue the modem to make it do various things or configure it. You have a set of dip switches to configure yet more things on the modem. It tells you what each pin of the uh, RS-232 serial port does. That's very cool. And you get a slider volume control because this modem has a built-in speaker. It actually looks just like this speaker right here which you want on a modem because when you call another computer you want to know what that call is doing in case something goes awry if it's just ringing and ringing you'll hear it ringing if there's a busy signal because it's already on another call um, or if the modems successfully connect to each other and begin handshaking you'll hear that too very useful the very last modems pretty much after the early 2000s uh, didn't even have a built-in speaker on them. Here is a very junk Connexent 56k modem from the late 2000s. No, uh, it's actually it's actually got the pads right there to put a piezo buzzer, and I almost wonder if I solder one in there if it actually works. Um, but it doesn't even come with one, so you just got to rely on your computer software to tell you to tell you what's going on. These are junk. They're, <laughs> they're only a modem in the most basic sense that they do modem things. What this actually is, is pretty much a sound card that has some glue logic to interface it to the telephone line. And uh, it's not even capable of producing the sounds on its own. Uh, the computer, it relies on the computer itself to generate all the bleeps and bloops that this modem sends out on the telephone line. So it actually actually relies on some of your computer's CPU cycles. So as far as modems go, these are pretty much the worst. But a modem like this has none of that. You don't even need a computer. Uh, you could hook this right up to a terminal, a serial terminal, and use it from there. And then of course, all the LEDs. Uh, we might as well go from left to right. The first LED HS, that means high speed. That just lights up if the modem is connected to the remote modem at 4800 baud or faster. If you're connected at 2400 baud or slower, that light will not light up. The next light over is AA, auto answer. If you have auto answer configured, such that the modem will automatically answer the line when a call comes in on your line that light will light up. That was a crucial feature if you were running a BBS or some other service where uh, people could call you and connect to your computer. The next light over CD, that's carrier detect. That lights up when the modems have finished handshaking and a successful connection has been established between them. The next light over is off hook. That lights up when the modem is off the hook. A very useful light indeed. The next light over is RD, receive data. That means the modem is receiving data from the remote modem and spinning it out to your computer. The next light over is SD, or send data. The modem is receiving data from your computer and sending it over the telephone line. TR means terminal ready. That means that the modem sees the uh, terminal ready signal coming from your computer serial port. So this light will light up when your computer's running, uh, when you have a valid terminal emulator program running, the program will signal that particular pin on the serial port to trigger this light to light up so you know your computer's functioning and working. The next light over is MR modem ready and this in its most basis, basic sense turns on when your modem is turned on. 
Uh, if your modem's turned on, this light is lit up unless something is seriously wrong. Although there is one instance uh, when this light will go out when the modem's turned on. Uh, I've seen the modem ready light go out if uh, the connection to the remote modem deteriorates and the modems have to re-handshake. This light will go out while the two modems are handshaking. Now these next two lights, RS and CS, are a little convoluted. RS means request to send, which means the computer is telling the modem, hey, be ready, I'm going to send you data. And then clear to send is the modem telling the computer, hey, I'm ready for you to send me data. That's what those two lights mean. Syn is synchronous. Um, I'm, I'm not clear. Like, modems operate in a synchronous mode or an asynchronous mode. Uh, we use asynchronous mode. The only time the modem would be in a synchronous mode would be like if it was connected to a mainframe or something like that. Um, so usually this light will be off. And then the final light is ARQ slash fax. ARQ means automatic repeat request. Uh, when this light is lit up, which it will be when you're on a good quality call to another modem that supports ARQ, it just means that a connection feature is enabled such that if the modem detects that it has received flawed data, it has the capability to say whoa to the remote modem and ask it to send that flawed data again. Or this light will light up when you're sending or receiving a fax, simple as that. Now, U.S. Robotics made many, many, many iterations of the Courier modem throughout the entire history of the Hayes compatible modem. Uh, this particular one is called the V. Everything, uh, which is what U.S. Robotics called their V.34 capable Courier modems. V.34 defines the 28.8K and 33.6K speeds. And they called this modem the V. Everything to advertise the fact that it supports every single standard uh, up to that time. Up to V.34, all the official standards from the original Bell 103 300 baud standard up to V.34 33.6K. In addition to non official standards that various modem manufacturers uh, came up with at the time. Uh, that were never ratified by the ITU. The V. Everything denotes that this modem also supports standards such as HST, which was a standard that US Robotics came up with that defined speeds up to 9600 baud at a time when the fastest official speed was 2400 baud, and HST actually improved over the next few years up to 24K. This modem also supports V.32 Turbo, spelled T-E-R-B-O. V.32 Turbo was an unofficial standard made by a few different manufacturers that defined speeds up to 19.2K at a time when the fastest official speed was 14.4K. So yeah, one of the things that made these modems great was they supported all of the major unofficial standards in addition to all of the official standards of the time. Where a lot of, you know, cheaper modems, like US Robotics' own Sportster modems, uh, only supported the official standards. And the cheaper Rockwell modems of the time, like this one, these were a cheap, affordable option for a modem at the time. They only supported the official standards. So that was one of the definitions of the so-called V. Everything. The other definition was that U.S. Robotics called this V. Everything because it could be upgraded as new standards came out. This is a 33.6K modem, but back in the day, U.S. Robotics did release a firmware upgrade for this that gave it 56K capability. The firmware file itself was free, and then if you paid U.S. Robotics, uh, they would dial into your modem and then, you know, turn on a piece of code in that firmware to enable 56K. So, you weren't screwed over if you bought a 33.6K modem and then two years later 56K came out, you would just pay them a little bit of money to upgrade your modem rather than paying a lot of money on a new modem. That was big 
at a time when sysops and businesses invested a ton of money into these courier modems, which are among the most expensive modems that you could buy at the time. And uh, you could be assured that you weren't wasting your money. That was pretty darn cool. V dot everything. Well, I think that's a good introduction to this thing and uh, serial modems in general. How about we go over to the computer, hook this thing up, hook it up to my telephone line, and uh, we'll play around with it a little bit. Alright, I have the modem set up here, hooked up to the Epson Apex Plus. You guys haven't seen this thing in quite a while. For anyone new who hasn't seen this before, this is one of the most prized of my uh, vintage computers. Uh, Epson Apex Plus made in 1988. It's a Turbo XT clone based on a generic design from Taiwan or Korea or somewhere. I, I forget, but um, the exact same computer was sold under the Packard Bell 500 name. V West Life owns one of those. But uh, this computer is really special to me. It was given to me by my high school math teacher back in 2010, 2011. So I've had this thing for a decade. And uh, I've done a crazy amount of upgrades to it over the years that I've had it. It now runs an NEC V20 CPU instead of the original 8088 clone that it had. I put an Intel 8087 math coprocessor in it. I put an IDE hard drive in it with a XT IDE card. And the uh, IDE hard drive sits in this cool little uh, removable bay. Uh, it's still running the uh, three and a half inch double density floppy drive that I originally got it with. Uh, it's got a Super VGA video card in it, a Seng ET4000 AX, which is a way overbuilt uh, <laughs> video card for a computer like this. It's a one megabyte SVGA card when the computer itself only has 640k of RAM, but it works. Uh, it's got a Sound Blaster Pro compatible. ESS sound card in it and that sound card has an onboard amplifier so I actually put in a second speaker right here that's connected to that sound card. Alright, computer's just booting up here. I'm going to turn on the modem with the switch in the back. And once it boots up you get the modem ready light and the clear to send light. And the computer's finished booting, so my terminal emulator of choice, there's a lot of them available for DOS. The one I like to use is called Bananacom. Uh, silly name, frickin' excellent program. Uh, the last version, which I'm running here, was released in 1998. So it's actually compatible with Windows, it's, it's Windows 9X aware. You, when you install it in Windows 95 or 98, it, it actually puts an entry in the start menu and it's, it's, the program itself is aware of, of uh, the presence of Windows. But it runs on an XT system too and it's just an excellent terminal emulator. Uh, it's an ANSI compatible terminal emulator. And uh, it can automatically detect your modem, detect the speed of your modem. Really excellent program. So you can see once I opened Bananacom, we've got two new lights. Uh, we've got our terminal ready light because opening Bananacom caused the uh, terminal ready pin on the serial port to go high. And we've got our request to send light because now that the modem sees that the terminal is ready, it's like, okay, send me, send me some stuff to put on the telephone line. So um, there's a lot of ways that you can test and configure and you know talk to the modem without even making a call. Hayes compatible modems use a set of commands that you can just you know type into the terminal and uh, all the commands are prefaced with AT meaning attention and uh, it was just a nice way to uh, prefix all the commands such that you know if you typed a command to the modem, whatever software, terminal software you, you were using wouldn't confuse that for a command for the computer itself or for the program itself. So the simplest command you can issue in a uh, Hayes compatible modem is just AT itself and you get an OK. That's your indication that you are successfully talking to the modem. 
Now, if you have keen eyes, you'll see down here it says COM1, which is the COM port that the modem's being seen on. COM1 57600, 57.6 57 kilobits per second. That's the speed that the modem is communicating with the computer. That doesn't denote the speed that the modem will be communicating over the telephone line. But the nice thing is, if I do change the speed that the uh, computer communicates with the modem at, for example, I just changed it to 300 bits per second, once I start typing AT, the nice thing about a modem like this uh, it, is it automatically detects when the serial port speed has changed. Other cheaper modems might uh, give you some garbage or echo back some garbage when you start typing because they don't realize that the speed has suddenly changed. So I'll put it back up to the detected speed here. If this computer were faster, I could use the 115.2 kilobit per second setting. This modem does support that, but the, this computer is not fast enough. The modem itself literally has a higher processor clock speed uh, than the computer. The CPU in this modem runs at 25 megahertz. So, uh, some useful commands to figure out what kind of a modem it is, is ATI. Um, there's several ATI pages, ranging from ATI1 to ATI7, usually. Um, the best one is ATI3, and it says US Robotics Courier V. Everything. Okay, uh, if I run an ATI1, it gives us that with this modem. ATI2 just says okay. So, not all modems utilize all of the uh, possible ATI pages. There we go, we run an ATI4 and it gives us US Robotic Courier V. Everything settings. Gives us all the S registers. S registers are a uh, really important way of configuring the modem to run exactly the way you like it. And it even, this one even tells you your last dialed number. Uh, only the better Hayes compatible modems store information like that. As a matter of fact, this modem actually has an onboard dialing directory. You can store, I think, 10 numbers into the modem's non-volatile RAM, and you can just run a short command to dial each number. That's pretty darn nifty. Only, only uh, higher-end modems did that. ATS-5 gives us some different... Uh, information here. Now I'm not sure why it says BOD 9600. I don't know if that was the last speed it connected over the telephone line or what. And there's your S registers again. These are all the ampersand, the AND commands. So there's a lot of commands that are prefixed by AT AND that said a lot of different things. For example, AT AND B0 tells the modem which answer tone to use. Zero being the uh, normal answer tone, or if I were to issue an AT and B1, that would tell the modem to use the uh, Bell answer tone, which was only used for Bell 103 and Bell 212 uh, modulation schemes. So uh, if you wanted to force the modem to use only either 300, 1200, or 2400 baud. Uh, speeds when answering a call doesn't affect when you're originating a call but if the modem answers a call and it's set to AT and B1 uh, it'll only connect it either 300, 1200 or 2400 baud. And then there's the dialing directory I just told you about. Ten different numbers numbered 0 to 9 that uh, you can store. And then um, I told you how the voice data switch could be programmed to do anything. Uh, this is my attempt to program the voice data switch to uh, automatically set an S register, which it is doing, but then it also puts the modem off hook for some reason when I press the button, so I still get to play around with that. And then I don't think there's... Oh, there is. Oh, look at that. So we get some statistics, some link diagnostics. Very cool. So if you are currently connected on a call, 
uh, you could press the escape sequence, which is plus 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 on a haze compatible modem. If you press, if you're on a call and you press plus plus plus, that brings the modem back into the command mode. So you're still on the phone call, but now you can issue commands to the modem. So you can hit plus 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 and then run an ATI six, and then take a look at the data for the uh, call that you've been on. Very very useful. And then ATI-7, there's the uh, hardware and firmware information. So this is, of course, a U.S.-Canada external model. Uh, our modulation options, uh, oh, 20 megahertz uh, clock speed. I think I said uh, uh, 25 earlier. 512K of ROM, 64K of RAM. The firmware dates 1998 because I did upgrade the firmware on this modem. And I think that's it for the ATI, yeah, that's it for the ATI pages. So uh, let's actually make a phone call. I'll call a BBS here. Um, oh, first of all, I do have some custom settings set on the modem. And I want to put it back to its defaults for the purposes of this demonstration. So I'm going to issue an AT and F1. AT and F1 on a Hayes compatible modem basically means load all of the factory default settings. And so I've done that. Now if I wanted to save those settings so that when I power the modem off and when I power it back on it's still on those settings I would run an AT and W but I'm not going to do that here. Uh, so AT and F1 means load the default settings for hardware flow control. If for some reason you needed software flow control you would run an AT and F0. So the modem's now running in its factory default configuration. Another simple but useful AT command is ATH, which means go on hook or off hook. Uh, ATH1 means go off hook. ATH0 or just ATH means go back on hook. So I'll run an ATH1 here. We have a dial tone. And if I want to dial a BBS, I can go ATDT, which means AT dial and then T for tone dial. Uh, you could do ATDP for pulse dial if you wanted. This modem can pulse dial a number. And then the number, it dials that number. But Bananacom has a nice phone book which I've filled up with uh, BBS's here. I'm going to call the Kludge or Kluge BBS because uh, it has the most reliable connection of any of these BBS's that I've tried. Uh, I asked the sysop of, of Cluj what kind of a modem he's running, and he's running a US Robotics Courier V dot everything. Uh, he's running the 56K model. So courier to courier, no wonder the connection is so good. So let's dial into Cluj here. See the off hook light lit up? We are ringing. There you go, pretty painless handshake for a VoIP connection. And then once we've connected, the modem spits out a result code, which is that guy. So it says connect 33600. So we're connected at the full 33.6K, which is great. Very rare that I can achieve that on a uh, over on my VoIP telephone line. Usually I, uh, I actually have the modem set to basically emulate a 14.4K modem, because that's about the fastest reliable speed I can usually get. But Cluj is an exception. Uh, ARQ, that's automatic uh, repeat request, um, which is an error correction scheme. V.34 for the class of speeds that we're connected at. Uh, LAPM is another uh, error correction thing. And then V.42 bis, which is a compression algorithm and also uh, denotes error correction. And then we've got a lot of lights here. I better log in before the connection drops. So I'm just going to log into this BBS. Sometimes if you just sit there at the login screen, 
depending on what uh, BBS software they're using. They'll just assume that you're a a, uh, a robot war dialing or something and just end the call. There we go. So we have a lot of lights on here now. Uh, we have our ARQ light on because we're using ARQ uh, data or error correction. Our off hook lights on, our carrier detect lights on, and our high speed lights on. And you've probably seen the receive data and send data lights uh, flicker when I type stuff and when the when the BBS is sending me data. I've seen the ARQ light uh, blink off and then back on a couple of times. That means that the connection is not totally stable. When your ARQ light goes off, that means uh, error correction is being used at that moment because the uh, connection is not great. Yeah, you can see it happening right now. That's just the reality of uh, having to use a VoIP telephone line. I'd actually gone on the forum here and I asked this off. I said I'm connected via PCXT clone 33.6K. Would be interested to hear what Sysop is using for a phone line and modem to get such a reliable dial-up connection. And then uh, uh, Sysop actually replied and said, cool, the server is a US robotics courier 3453. The model 3453 was the well, there were a few 3453 models. One is, uh, the first, the original 3453 is a V90 modem, but then there was the 3453B, which is a V92 model, and then a 3453C, which was also a V92 model with some other improvements. So I don't know if he's running the V90 or the V92 version. Uh, server has a US Raj courier modem that gets analog data from a Grandstream HT 814 ATA, which routes through my asterisk server, which routes SIP through Twilio, which must be a VoIP provider. So there you go. So there's dialing into a BBS. Connection's been holding pretty solid despite the uh, error correction kicking in a few times. So we'll log out of this. Dink. Modem clicks goes back on hook and we get no carrier which is the uh, standard haze result code for when the connection is lost. There is a look at a US Robotics Courier V. Everything serial modem from 1996. Probably more information than you wanted to know about modems and serial modems and about this serial modem. But uh, I friggin love this stuff. I have become so obsessed with modems and using modems uh, in the past few weeks just because they're the perfect perfect marriage of two of my favorite things vintage computing and telephony so it's uh, no wonder that now that I've finally gotten this modem working that uh, I'm just going modem crazy lately as you guys have seen especially if you follow my Twitter there's gonna be another video featuring this modem in the future. I'm going to show some fun, cool, and useful stuff you can do playing uh, with the more advanced commands that you can issue the modem, changing the register settings, making it emulate uh, older classes of modems. Um, just uh, really neat stuff you can do to really customize the modem, make it work exactly the way you want, and uh, and uh, do some fun things to play around with it, stuff like that. But until then, thank you so much for watching. Uh, also, thank you to these names right here who support me via Patreon. And until next time, thank you, and I'll see you in the next video.